Welcome Wargamers to Seraphon Week. With 2nd edition fast approaching, I wanted to take a minute to highlight one of the coolest armies out there. In fact, the last week of lore reviews I'm going to do for 1st edition actually starts off with the first battle tome that came out revitalizing one of the older armies because it first came out with uh, Stormcast and Bloodbound, which are totally new, but the first faction to be brought from the old world to the AOS was the Seraphon, and that's the note that I want to go out on in saying goodbye to 1st edition. So let's talk about this army because a lot of things have changed and our understanding of how they function in the mortal realms has changed dramatically and evolved over time that AOS has been out. So we're going to kick off this discussion talking about who the Seraphon were in the old world. Well back then they were known as the Lizardmen and they had a very long history in the old world. A lot of great lore. If you want to learn anything more about this stuff, I'm going to briefly mention here. Like I said, when I talk about the old world, I skim the surface for new people and that's about it. But they have a colossal Wikipedia page over at the Warhammer Fantasy Battles wiki. Go check it out. But really what they were was they were created by a race called the Old Ones, put on the old world, and one of their primary missions was to keep chaos at bay. They had a massive civilization and really what they used we would know them as ley lines, but nexus points, these points of high energy in the old world. And so they would set up towers and fortresses there. And if you interconnected them, it kind of created an energy system that the Slon can use to manipulate the world around them. They were not bred. They literally were created out of these kind of gestation pools, if you will. And they were just a super unique faction in the old world. Nothing was like them. It was almost high technology by aliens that looked like magic to everyone else, and when you're in a setting that actually has magic, that's just kind of how it was taken. But like I said, their main goal towards the end was to hold off chaos, and in that regard, they failed. The End Times happened, and if you haven't seen my review of The End Times, I basically condensed all five, I believe, of The End Times campaign books into one video. I'll link it up top right there in the corner. But what happened at one of the books was uh, the Slon were getting just absolutely decimated by Skaven, one of their longtime enemies. So when it truly became hopeless, there was no absolute chance of them winning. The Slon retreated back into their temples, the doors closed, and the ground started to quake as they lifted off the ground. It turns out these temples were actually ships of some kind. Which is interesting because it makes them technically the only true survivors, like refugees of the old world. All the other ones are like god-level deities cast into like the ether or resurrected by chaos gods. But these guys are just like, they just survived, which makes them pretty unique. And that's the last we saw them in the old world was them just basically leaving because the mission was lost and there's no more hope left, right? They can't beat chaos in these ways on this turf. So how does that translate into where they are now in Age of Sigmar? Well, they took a dramatic change with their lore. Because at this point, as we know them now, the only living Seraphon, truly living Seraphon, are the Salon. Those big toad dudes you see riding around in the flying seats. And the Salon are impossibly ancient and powerful wizards who lead their race. We're going to talk more about them tomorrow, but just understand right now that they are really the focal point of this army. And while they continued their mission in fighting chaos, it's really when Sigmar busted back open the gates of Azir and kind of restarted the battle for the mortal realms. The Seraphon had really taken a more prominent role in the battlefield. So like I said, Sloan are the only living ones, so what is everyone else? They have a beautiful model line. If you have not seen the Seraphon model range, stop what you're doing, go check it out while we're talking about it. It's a phenomenal range of models. To put it briefly, they're memories, or at least that's a theory. The Slon remember their warriors from eons ago, back when they were fighting in the, in the old world, and they literally resurrect them, they reconstruct them out of the stuff of raw magic to bring them back and have them fight on the battlefield once more. Because at this point they're beings of pure energy and light that has been sort of like crystallized into an image of people that they fought with and loved before. So a Slon, in a given situation, knowing what needs to be done to fight chaos, will recall, for example, a mighty source warrior or an old blood uh, veteran, you know, scar veteran, and those things that just, they will literally just materialize out of sheer willpower and magic and burst into the realms and do some epic fighting. Now, at the time that the battle time came out, we really didn't have a good idea of how, frankly, the structure of the realms were and what this was supposed to look like. We didn't know a lot about demons. They share a lot of commonalities with chaos demons in the sense that uh, the book makes it seem like they kind of just disappear after every battle, much as we understood that demons did, like chaos demons. However, we've learned since then that that's not quite how things work in AOS. It is in 40k, and it was in the old world, where dem demonic stuff would just kind of dissipate over time if it wasn't constantly fueled by like a rift or something. Not the case here. I'll put the picture up right here right now, but we actually have confirmation from a white dwarf Q&A 
that uh, someone asked, do they just dissipate every time? Do you need a slon to have this army, thematically speaking? And they responded, no, they don't just dissipate, they actually stay around, just like chaos demons do, as I mentioned before. Once that magic takes shape, it is a permanent thing until it is destroyed, until the vessel is destroyed. And like I said, this fits with what we know as chaos demons, and functionally, they are kind of identical in the sense that they are raw stuff of magic put into a concrete form, which is what the Seraphon technically are. And what this also means is that armies without a slon are perfectly valid. There's actually stories in the battle tome that when you add this kind of understanding to make more sense of how a slon will be in deep contemplation about his next move and his army will go off and fight a battle just so he doesn't get distracted. Well, that means they're operating independently of him, right? Well, yeah, that makes more sense if he summoned them. They exist, period and then go out and conduct themselves as if they normally would. Remember these, when we're talking about memories, we're not just saying like, it looks like this guy he used to fight with. It is the embodiment of everything that person was. Like he is functionally resurrected. It just took the slon to do it. But now he's alive, quote unquote. He's his own soul being and can go conduct himself accordingly to the slon's will. So that is kind of an update to what we knew before. I did a uh, Seraphon video a long time ago but a lot of that has changed since that Q&A, and also seeing them kind of interact with more factions in the Mortal Realms. I'm actually way more hyped about this book now, knowing we understand about them, than I was when I made that original video. Part of it too is that at the time, GW wasn't giving us a lot of firm answers. A lot of the things we knew about them were theories, right? Just to keep them mysterious, everything was theory. Well, let's talk about some of those theories. There's a few revolving around kind of different aspects of them. So for example, the, the moon monks of Hayish think that they are the children of Dracothian, who was the sort of god beast dragon that befriended Sigmar. And that's how we have the uh, dragon mounts that the Stormcast Eternals ride, which makes sense. They're both reptilian in nature, but there's not necessarily a connection between the two. There's a faction called the Wood Lords of the Forest Claw, and they think that the Seraphon travel in basically spaceships that allows them to go from realm to realm without the use of a realm gate. Then there are the Prophets of the Whispering Tower, who think that they are made of the stuff of chaos. Meaning, they're not great guys, they just kind of have their own motive. Maybe like a fifth chaos god who just thwarts the others. Um, and that one's kind of out there, but they're not on the wrong track. I mean, they are... There's a lot of similarities to demons. There are solidified magic given a character and a personality, but there are some pretty distinct differences. Instead of chaos magic, uh, this is taking pure magic from Azir, like the realm of heavens, not necessarily Sigmar, but the realm of heavens, solidifying that and forging it into a person or a lizard. So now I want to talk about how they fit into order. Order the Grand Alliance. Well, we know they hate chaos, and it's always their primary target. They don't really come to aid their allies so much as fight chaos. And what they bring to the table is pretty unique. It's not really the army that's their main weapon, but their intellect. The Battle Tome specifically states, and I actually really love this, the Chaos Gods have learned very little from their time in the Mortal Realms. By that I mean, they're always up to the same tricks, the same tactics, and always the same folly. Zinch always gets so deep into his plans and conniving that he inevitably has his own cults fight each other, and there's just really dumb wars where something could have been simple. He could have won easily, but he has to complicate it because that's what Jeans does. Korn always is just a blunt instrument, very short-sighted, but very powerful, but you can redirect things like that. And then Slanesh falls to his own indulgences. Nurgle basically stops to smell and then corrupt the roses and enjoy the gardens that he makes, but he doesn't really push in the war effort so much. Again, all the same mistakes, but they've been doing the same things for forever, whereas the Slon have been learning. These are super intelligent beings that keep learning from mistakes that they make and the mistakes of others. And the Slon view the mortal realms as like this great game board, right? And they study their opponents so well. In the stories that you read about them, they appear at the right time in the right place. If Zinch has a plan that has a hinge on it, like there's just a specific moment that something has to go right, that is where the Seraphon will hit and make sure it is goes wrong. If Korn's armies are battered and beaten and they need rest, when they're resting, that is when the Seraphon will strike. If there's a very important ceremony happening, like a Chaos Sorcerer is trying to achieve something, right at his moment where he's weakest, like about to complete what he's ever he's trying to do, that is when they hit them. And this really embodies fighting smart, not necessarily hard. Not to mention, they do fight super hard. Like These are great people in combat, but they do it in a very intelligent way, knowing that there's so few of them compared to like the huge, endless, vast hordes of Chaos. And while they are unified in purpose, the Seraphon are a very divided race. First off, 
They are just a sliver of who they used to be. The Slon themselves rarely meet up, often spend a millennia alone in solitude, just kind of on personal campaigns, individual crusades to go defeat chaos in a given area, and their nature also divides them from other order armies. When you don't care about time or space, your perspective is different. Things look different in terms of importance and value, whereas Sigmar might go give up everything just to defend a city or a society because those people have the right to live and choose for themselves is a very noble thing. The Slon may look at that and say, I need that city to fall because the amount of resources that that corn army will spend to take it is going to be so great that I can hit them afterwards and eliminate it. Right, and you can see that because they're playing the big picture, the big game, making sacrifices that other deities, frankly, would not be willing to make. So in that regard, it's easy to see why these factions have friction with one another. So let's talk about why these guys are cool. And this is going to set the tone for the rest of the week. This is one of the coolest factions out there. And I'm not even talking about models. If you put a dream team together to fight chaos, right? If you're going to be like, I need the best and the brightest, the A team to fight the four chaos gods, you're going to want the smartest guy in the room on your team, right? The guy who's intelligent, but also emotionless, who can make the hard calls. He's a good person to have on your team. Because think of the times that being irrational has hurt order as a whole. I'm thinking like, you know, uh, Age of Myth, right before the Age of Chaos, like where Chaos really became Ascendant. You have uh, Sigmar hunting Nagash. Well, you have Nagash opening the door to Chaos. Then you have Sigmar stopping his war effort against Chaos to go hunt him because now he's got a personal grudge, which is like the wrong move. You got Sigmar getting mad and throwing Galmaraz. You got Alario becoming morose and just hiding in the realm of life secluding herself from the others. Grimnir and Gorkamorka get antsy and they have to go pick a fight with something so Gorkamorka splits off and does his own thing. Grimnir blows up when he fights Volcatrix that we talked about last week. So having someone who's cool, level-headed, with an intellect and a, and a mind to play the game to win is actually something that is sadly wholly unique to order. However, this also makes them entirely alien to other order armies, right? They don't speak the same tongue or have the same ideas of importance. You can't even relate to them like on like family values, right? Because like, in, you know, even cultures here on Earth, we don't always get along, of course, obviously, but we can always like understand maternal love or something like that, you know, something very human. They don't even have any of those things in common. These things, they're just artificial solidifications of magic. They don't have anything in common with the common, say, free guild person. The only thing that they do share is a common hatred for chaos, but how to tackle that problem looks vastly different to a near immortal and extremely powerful being like a Slon. As we said before, Sigmar cares for the lives of mortals. He wants independent freedom and liberty and to choose your own destiny and to make or break yourself, right? It's what order is all about. But Seraphon don't see that as being enough of a goal. The goal has to be the eradication of the four chaos gods. So yeah, they'll sacrifice a city, they'll sacrifice a continent if they have to, to achieve that same thing. And you can see how that looks bad. You can see how it looks bad, especially if they can't explain themselves. If they don't see, frankly, you worthwhile taking the time to explain themselves to, but also because they literally cannot with the language barrier. So you can see how if you were an order person and you're, you're on that continent and you get sacrificed, you may have a bad taste in your mouth and think that these Seraphon are bad guys, omens of destruction, things like that, when in actuality they're just doing the same thing but in a very different way and on a completely different scale. We talked about it in Daughters of Cain a little bit, but the whole idea of order does not mean good. What it means is the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and in this case, the enemy is chaos. And we, we mentioned that same idea for Daughters of Cain, who are very brutal and savage in combat and things like that. And for them, you know, they were they were BA ladies with very nefarious motives and you get up to the Marathi level, it's very selfish and, you know, you're like, why are these guys good? Because they're clearly not good, they're just kind of faking it till they make it, getting in there as soon as Chaos is dead, you know that they're gonna, like, usurp, try to take over for Sigmar, but these guys are a little bit wholly different. These are very aloof creatures, very disconnected from other societies. So the idea of, like, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, they just have different contexts with these factions. And all these things together make a first of all beautiful army that plays exceptionally well that is exciting to learn about cool to craft a narrative for and i am so pumped for this week uh the, basically the schedule how it's going to go is tomorrow we're going to talk about the slon after that we're going to review the saurus units after that the skinks and lastly all the monsters and creatures that they summon forth to make these wars possible so friends thank you all so much for watching i look forward to seeing you in my next age of sigmar lore video happy wargaming